Um, Ambassador Jack Pritchard is currently the president of the Korean Economy Institute and has been actively involved in Korean affairs through numerous government positions. He served as a special assistant to the president of President for National Security Affairs and Senior Director for Asian Affairs in the Clinton Administration. He also served as an ambassador and special envoy for negotiation with the PRK and U.S. represented to the Korean Peninsula Energy Development Organization in the Bush Administration from 2001 till 2003. And it's my great honor to present to you Ambassador Jack Pritchard and please welcome him with a warm applause. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for allowing me to come all the way down the elevator from my offices on the 10th floor. The, it, it was a very attractive offer. I didn't have to travel very far. Uh, I, I want you to continue having your lunch. Um, I, I've taken a look at your agenda, and I'm very impressed with the subjects and your speakers. So I had a little bit of difficult time trying to figure out what it is that I'm going to talk about that won't duplicate what you're already seeing and hearing today. There's a number of interesting topics that are very current, uh, not only from a historical point of view, but things that are going on, uh, maritime issues, the NLL, uh, lots of different things. But what I've chosen today to talk about is uh, summetry, the importance of leadership at the very highest level in dealing with issues. I'm going to do this in, in two parts. One, as it suggests, uh, talking about the importance of the involvement of the President of the United States, Prime Ministers, and the President of the Republic of Korea. But I also want to reserve a little time to do something that's both historical and current, and that is the role of former presidents. And I want to talk specifically about uh, Jimmy Carter and his recent trip uh, as well and where that plays in. To give you a sense of the importance of a relationship between two leaders, uh, I want to go back to my time at the White House um, towards the end of the Clinton administration. He was having a meeting with the Prime Minister of Japan, uh, Prime Minister Mori at the time. And I was the note taker in the Oval Office. And I noticed the President starting to write a note. And he handed it to the National Security Advisor. And if you're a lowly note taker in the White House, your, your, your eyes and your ears, everything perks up. Because you have a sense that you're going to be asked to answer the question that the President has. That wasn't the case this time. National Security Advisor Berger unfolded the note, looked at it, pulled out his pen, and he wrote an answer. And that's always dangerous. You know, and when you're the, uh, the expert, or at least you think that you're expert, the expert, and one of your more senior uh, uh, bosses answers in an area in which you think that you're the expert, you, you think, uh-oh, you know, he's going to give the president the wrong answer. It wasn't until a little bit later that uh, Sandy Berger told me what that exchange was. And it kind of highlights and punctuates what I want to talk about. The President of the United States, in the middle of a meeting in the Oval Office with the leader of Japan, writes a note to Sandy Berger and he says, can you name all of the prime ministers who have been my counterpart and in order? And Berger, you know, he wrote all of them. He got one out of order. The point is that there were seven prime ministers that were the counterpart to Bill Clinton. Now, with the exception of uh, Ritaro Hashimoto, who was in office for 30 months, uh, most of the prime ministers were there seven months, nine months, two months, 20 months, 19 months, 10 months you cannot develop a relationship. And that development of, at the very highest levels cannot permeate down in a positive way to those who are in charge of developing uh, policy and executing 
to enhance the relationship. In the case of George Bush, he had five Japanese prime ministers. The, in, in, you know, four of them lasted three months, four months, 12 months, and 12 months. But in Bush's case, he was extraordinarily lucky, particularly when you take a look at Japanese history, uh, in that uh, Prime Minister Koizumi was there for 65 months, and that was an extraordinarily long amount of time. And the distinction that I would make is that Bush and Koizumi were able to develop a, a relationship that is probably a, epitomized by where and what the president did to say farewell to Koizumi as he left office. And you may recall, he took him to Graceland, the home of Elvis Presley, because Koizumi was a fan of Elvis Presley. President Obama has had it easy so far. He's only had three Japanese prime ministers, <laughs> one of seven months, one of nine months, and now he's on a three month, which could have ended rather quickly. Uh, had the outcome of the LDP, or excuse me, the Japan uh, De Democratic Party turned out differently recently. Well, let's turn and take a look at the relationship for Korea and the United States. Now, Bill Clinton had three presidents, and in the, the point that I'm not make, uh, gonna make here is not that it is the sense of longevity, but the compatibility, both philosophically and um, on a personal level. Bill Clinton had uh, five years with Kim Young sam three years with Kim Dae-jung, and just uh, a, uh, a year or so, uh, well, I take that back. He didn't, ha he didn't uh, uh, fall into um, no more hit. So he had two. But he had a, um, a very good relationship with uh, Kim Dae-jung. He had an admiration for things that Kim Dae-jung had done prior to becoming president of Korea. I can recall that when the news broke that Kim, uh, uh, Kim Dae-jung had received the Nobel Peace Prize, that President Clinton said, get me a phone. I want to call. I want to make a congratulation. So he had a personal investment uh, in the success of his counterpart. and that. I think was uh, very emblematic of the relationship at the time. Now George Bush has had three Korean presidents to work with. He had two years with Kim Dae-jung, full five years with No Mo Hyun, and the first year with Lee Ming bak I think you all are aware of the rocky start to the relationship between President Bush and Kim Dae-jung. That first, uh, uh, as I, my recollection is, uh, that first encounter occurred in a matter of weeks after George Bush became president when there was a phone call uh, to be scheduled between President Kim Dae-jung and President Bush. Uh, it obviously took place in the evening because of the time difference. Uh, it was in the, uh, the treaty room of the White House upstairs in the personal uh, floor. Uh, the president, and as that phone call was getting underway, you know, those of us in the room could only hear one part of the conversation, but it was going on and on without George Bush saying anything. He was listening to a lecture uh, by Kim Dae-jung on the importance of engagement with North Korea. And it wasn't very long into this where George Bush took the phone away from his ear, covered up the mouthpiece, mouthpiece and said, who is this old man? <laughs> uh, yeah, that kind of stunned the few of us that were in the room. Uh, and unfortunately, the consequences of that was after that phone call was over with and after I had gone home, I got a phone call from the national security advisor saying, come back to work and answer the president's question. And so at 11 o'clock at night, I went back to the White House to write a memo on who was this old man. You got a sense of where this was going uh, as Kim Dae-jung came to Washington uh, about a month later. Yeah, I think it was in March of 2001. Those of us at the working level kept saying to our counterparts, don't come. The time is not right. The president is not ready. 
but yet there was a sense that this needed to be done. And I think that it's understandable as those of us that work in the American system, uh, we sometimes take for granted the importance of the President of the United States and the influence that he has both uh, domestically in other countries and on an international scale. So there is an understandable desire for other world leaders uh, to meet a new president, to judge how that relationship is going to go, and uh, hopefully uh, create a better atmosphere in which uh, our common policies can be worked out uh, to a mutual benefit. Kim, De Kim Dae-jong came, um, and that probably marked the downfall of Secretary of State Powell, uh, and I won't go into that detail. But to, just to give you that sense uh, of how things were occurring. When Lee Myung-bak came in, George Bush had a sigh of relief. Uh, he had just spent five years uh, in a very testy relationship with No Mo Hyun. I think there are probably many of you out there that might suggest that I've, I've overinflated the difficulty, but I, I don't think so. The language that was used by both presidents privately and publicly suggested they didn't really get along. Uh, their staff tried to portray that, but when you take a look at the public record, there is a mismatch in personalities and philosophies. And there was an uneasiness in the development of our mutual policies towards North Korea. And as I say, when Lee myung bak came in, George Bush found what he believed to be a soulmate in terms of a conservative philosophy towards dealing with North Korea. Um, and I think as those of us who watched this wondered aloud at the end of the Bush administration, when I think there were some concerns by our Korean colleagues that it was George Bush who was becoming too soft uh, towards the North Koreans. Uh, this was, as you may know, uh, toward the end of the Bush administration, a, a race for a legacy uh, in dealing with North Korea in, in some aspects of that. So there's a little bit of concern as we watched Barack Obama become elected President of the United States and with the anticipation of what would occur when a new Democrat, young Democrat, perhaps a Democrat in the flavor of Bill Clinton were to come to the White House with what we anticipated to be a very engaging attitude towards North Korea at a time when the South Koreans were relatively conservative and some would say a hard line towards the North Koreans. There was a little bit of concern that we would have yet another mismatch uh, between presidents and we understood what the downfall and the consequences of that would be. I'm not sure who gets the credit, whether it is Lee Myung-bak, who understood the importance of the relationship, and regardless of the anticipated philosophy, made a determined effort to become Barack Obama's friend, if you will. I, I don't know. Uh, it may well be the uh, receptive nature of Barack Obama and his exposure to the international scene and his appreciation for Korea before coming to office. Whatever it was, the two of them genuinely clicked. They get along. They like each other. The consequences of that, as you have seen, is, uh, for lack of a, a better phrase, Korea is punching above its fighting weight on the international scene. Now, what does that mean? It means Korea is a, a, a middle power. It's a rising middle power. Uh, but yet, it is at the, at the center of the international economic decisions, in large part based upon not only the attitudes of wanting to do that and being a player, but the relationship with the President of the United States. In just a couple of months, as you all know, Korea will be hosting the G20, unprecedented for a non-G8 player. Uh, there is a great deal of credit to be given to both leaders in what they have decided to do 
not only because they like each other, because they both genuinely understand the importance of the relationship. What to look for in this type of symmetry in the future? It has an effect on U.S. policy. It has an effect on Korean policy. What I think that we're seeing now is the beginnings of adjustments in the Obama administration's approach to its North Korea policy. But yet, the administration has been extraordinarily cautious on how to do that. Why? Because of the relationship with the ROK, because of the circumstances that have been going on most recently following the sinking of the Chonan. The United States has been extraordinarily careful not to get out in front of where the Korean policy, the Korean president, and the Korean public are with regard to re-engagement of North Korea. That's a testimony to the strength of the relationship. I think we're going to continue to see that more and more. And I, for one, applaud that. Let me speak a little bit now, if I can just switch topics, to President Jimmy Carter. Um, as you know, Carter has had a previous incarnation in Korean matters in 1994, June 16th and 17th to be exact, uh, 16 years ago. Uh, and I won't go through the history of how he became involved or what the administration of Bill Clinton thought of his involvement uh, at the time. But nonetheless, there's a history there. What we have most recently is a series of Americans over a, a, a number of years who have unfortunately crossed into North Korea without the authorization of the North Koreans and have been arrested. Up until recently, they have been held and turned back. We have a little bit of a history just to, to set the stage. Uh, my first recollection, uh, besides the downed helicopter pilot uh, that Tony Hall was involved with, uh, he and Tom Hubbard involved with the return, was with an American called uh, Evan Hunzinger. Uh, in, um, I think, was probably, uh, sometime in 1996, might, it might have been 97, uh, in which this kid was uh, probably drunk, went across the Yalu, swimming, floating, holding bottles, I'm not sure, was picked up by the North Koreans and held. Uh, he was threatened to be charged with espionage. Uh, the State Department and those of us who were involved in this negotiated with the North Koreans for his return. Uh, the final piece was a requirement by the North Koreans for someone of prominence to come pick him up. Now, that person wasn't charged with the negotiation of the release of, uh, of the individual, and as you may recall, it was Bill Richardson. Uh, he went, uh, returned with Evan Hunzinger, and probably set uh, an unfortunate precedent of uh, a sense of blackmail in which a prominent American would be required not to negotiate, but simply to show up. Uh, and that's what has happened uh, most recently. It, it's happened on a couple of occasions. The, the ones that we're most familiar with are, occurred a year ago with the two uh, female journalists uh, that ended in August of 2009 with Bill Clinton going uh, the release had already been negotiated in advance, regardless of what the public statements were. Uh, Bill Clinton went, met with uh, Kim Jong-il. You may recall uh, the photograph of that meeting in which you have a very stoic Bill Clinton uh, sitting there and a Cheshire grin on Kim Jong-il's face. Uh, and you can see in his mind that he had finally gotten the meeting with Bill Clinton that he so desperately wanted. Uh, it just happened to occur nine years after the fact. Now, you may recall that uh, uh, 
in the summer and then fall of 2000, there was an opening, a charm offensive, and a number of other things going on in North Korea, uh, one of which resulted in uh, Kim Jong-il sending, uh, at that time, his military uh, ed senior person. Uh, some of the time would even claim that Jo Myung-nak was uh, kind of the number two in power. Uh, he came, met with Bill Clinton. He was desperate uh, to get Bill Clinton to agree to a letter of invitation that he brought uh, from Kim Jong-il, uh, in which Kim Jong-il invited Bill Clinton to go to Pyongyang. Uh, and the verbal message from Jo Myung-nak was, if you come, uh, Chairman Kim guarantees that he will satisfy all of your security concerns. That was a very enticing proposition. Uh, without going into the history, uh, that didn't happen. Uh, for a number of reasons. Middle East crept into that uh, U.S. presidential election uh, and a thing called CHADS uh, entered into the uh, equation. Uh, but nonetheless, nine years later, uh, Bill Clinton went. Uh, I don't think that was the correct thing to do. Uh, I'm not suggesting we should have left the two journalists uh, in prison for the entire sentence, uh, but there's something unseemly about sending ex-presidents and senior envoys simply to escort uh, someone back that has been pre-negotiated their, their release. With the most recent occurrence of Mr. Gomes, uh, as you may know, uh, he was tried, convicted, sentenced. Uh, he is reported to have attempted suicide. There's some concern there about his, uh, his health. That's understandable. Now, what you have emerging out of President Carter's account that you may have seen yesterday in the New York Times where he wrote an op-ed is the North Koreans asking for Mr. Carter to come. And in Jimmy Carter's words, no one else would have been acceptable. No one else's request to go would have been honored. They wanted me, Jimmy Carter, to come to revive the denuclearization agreements and the road to peace that had begun on Jimmy Carter's intervention uh, 16 years ago. I'm not going to take, yes I am, I'm going to take a lot of issue with uh, Mr. Carter's account. <laughs> Information that I have from other people that have been involved in this process suggests a couple of things. One. There were two other individuals involved, uh, Senator Kerry, understandably Mr. Gomes is from his state of Massachusetts, uh, offered to go, wanted to go. The North Koreans didn't accept his offer. Bill Richardson offered to go and was accepted by the North Koreans. But it was the administration who suggested to Bill Richardson now is not the time. We don't want you to go. The reason and the explanation, as I understand it, goes back to what I was just talking about. The administration was very concerned that a high-profile individual going at that time as the punishment of North Korea for the sinking of the Chonan was under, being undertaken would not have sat well with our Korean friends. And so the administration simply denied Bill Richardson the opportunity uh, to go back again uh, to North Korea to escort a person. As the North Koreans became frustrated that Bill Richardson was not coming, there was a suggestion made uh, that Jimmy Carter could get involved. And the North Koreans then turned their invitation to Jimmy Carter. From a separate piece of information, I understand that Jimmy Carter said, I'll go only if you can guarantee that I will see Kim Jong-il. When the White House took a look at the timing, took a look at the condition in terms of Mr. Gomes, and made a decision to allow uh, Jimmy Carter to accept this trip, they made it very, very clear that Mr. Carter was doing this as a private citizen, as a humanitarian gesture, and in no way was associated with U.S. policy, the administration, in any way, shape, or form. 
there were no State Department officials accompanying Mr. Carter. There was no U.S. government plane involved. So you go through the litany of what it was not, and the North Koreans became disillusioned in terms of what is the value then of Mr. Carter other than having a high-profile American come. Mr. Carter was told in advance, as he indicates in his uh, op-ed uh, of yesterday, uh, that the North Koreans said, you're not going to be able to see Kim Jong-il. But yet he decided to go anyway. Uh, either he is nothing but a humanitarian, uh, or he had hoped for a different outcome there. What I'd like to point out uh, to this, uh, this event is the importance of positive leadership engagement. We've had a number of examples in which our philosophies did not match, and that's understandable. And it falls then to the professional diplomats and others in the U.S. government and their counterparts to figure out a way for the sake of the alliance. That's happened on a couple of occasions. Uh, both with Japan, uh, that's what's happening now, by the way, uh, and with the uh, Republic of Korea, particularly during the No Mo Hyun and late uh, Kim Dae-jung periods, uh, in which the importance of the relationship was so great that we worked through the difficulties that the leaders were having with each other, or the lack of interaction they were. On the positive side, when you look at from either a Japan or a U.S. point of view, the relationship between the United States and Japan during the Koizumi years that coincided directly with the entire tenure of, uh, or the, his tenure with uh, President Bush, a lot of positive things occurred. Uh, as you look now at the relationship of Lee Myung-bak to the last year with George Bush, and then this uh, first 19 or 20 months of uh, President Obama, uh, you have to see the positive benefits of what that relationship has done. Uh, even at the working level, the environment is even much better. Uh, we have always, for the sake of the importance of the relationship, worked through the difficulties we've had that have resulted because of negative uh, influenced by our leaders. Here we've had for the last uh, two and a half plus years uh, an opportunity for good things to happen, and they have. They have been manifest by an improving uh, uh, international um, activities by South Korea, uh, an unprecedented level of goodwill between our two nations. Uh, and I think it is it, that w which is important that when the inevitable incident occurs that requires um, a smoothing over, uh, that it will be the positive relationship of our uh, two presidents uh, that will uh, come to the rescue of such an important um, uh, relationship. Let me kind of end there, if I, if I will. I've talked enough, I think. Uh, I, I, I've told um, Ellen that uh, we can have a Q&A period for which anything is on the table. Uh, it does not have to be on this topic. I'm happy to, uh, uh, to talk about succession uh, or anything else you'd like to. Thank you very much. Hi, Larry. Larry Nation, CSIS. Along the lines of your uh, discussion of high level meetings, I wanted to ask you if you can shed any light on the claim made by Ambassador Gregg in his August 31st New York Times op ed piece, in which he criticized. Yeah. 
Yeah, Larry, uh, one I don't know, and, and there's, there's pieces to this that I could only conjure up, and, and the question that I have in mind is, who suggested this as an invitation? Now, if you tell me Don Gregg made the uh, suggestion to the uh, Obama administration, it'd be just a terrific idea, and that they can convert him, and, and he'll go back and have a, a revolutionary, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, in economics and democracy. Uh, you know, he may very well have made that suggestion. If you're saying that there, it's a, a suggestion by another head of state, I, you know, I have a hard time believing that. I don't have a hard time believing that the administration would have rejected it uh, as um, um, implausible, uh, one in which that we, it would not have been well received, it would not have uh, occurred, uh, it would have been simply a waste of time at a point in time when the relationship didn't uh, suggest something like that. So, one, I don't know anything about it, but I, I find that, that I would not put any credibility in it as a legitimate uh, suggestion. Sir? Is that My question to you is that uh, how do you comment on the, uh, the U.S. and South Korea's plan to have a naval exercise with uh, U.S. nuclear submarine and the uh, air carrier, mm -hmm. uh, aircraft carrier to the Yellow Sea since they have already had one in the uh, Sea of Japan or the East Sea of uh, Korea. Thank you. Since this is a, a history one, we ought to say East Sea rather than the Sea of Japan. Um, well, let, let's go through that. Uh, the following the sinking of the Chonan, it appeared that there were a number of steps that could be taken. There could be unilateral action by South Korea. There could be multilateral action by the United States and South Korea. There could be international action at the UN Security Council. All of those took place. In addition to that, the United States, as you know, has taken its own unilateral actions in terms of additional sanctions against the uh, 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 Democratic People's Republic of uh, of Korea. Um, but when we go down to what makes sense in terms of refining your capabilities based upon what may be perceived as a uh, deficiency uh, in your ability to detect uh, North Korean submarines, your ability to gather intelligence, your ability to react in a timely fashion, to do it in a, in a joint or a combined response. Uh, it makes sense to have those types of exercises, to uh, focus on where you need uh, more practice. Now, the first set of exercises had an element of WikiLeaks to them. Uh, in which this is leaking uh, information uh, in advance, uh, in some cases it may not have actually been true in terms of whether or not the uh, U.S. carrier George Washington would participate in the exercises where they'd be in the West Sea, uh, etc. However that, uh, that came about, the, what I believe to be a realization by certainly the United States and probably by the Republic of Korea is an unnecessary provocation of China was not the intent. Um, I'm sure that the exercise had a indirect message to the Chinese in terms of their actions in support of North Korea at the United Nations was unhelpful and that there certainly were diplomatic consequences. But I don't think the message ever was intended to send a military message to China. And so however you want to look at that, from a prudent point of view, the exercise occurred uh, in the East Sea. Now, compounding this was a Chinese assertion that the United States carrier ought not to be in the West Sea. 
Uh, you cannot do that. You cannot say that, particularly to the Department of Defense, where freedom of navigation is extraordinarily important uh, in international waters, which is where this was going to be held. Uh, and so there is a, a pushback of sorts. So it, it does not surprise me that at a point in time of the choosing of the United States and South Korea, that there will be additional exercises, that they will involve uh, anti-submarine warfare, and that it could involve involved uh, a carrier in, in the West Sea. That carrier has exercised there, uh, I think, as recently as a year ago. Uh, so it's not a, a point of creating a precedent, but is asserting uh, an international right. Uh, I don't think that it is intended to destabilize the region in any way, but to make sure uh, that the point is well understood that this is not provocative. These exercises have been described as defensive, uh, and considering the origin, the sinking of the Chonan, uh, you have to uh, go along with that. I don't think there's anything untoward uh, with what's happening with regard to the exercises in the West Sea. Tom Berkman from the University of Buffalo. Uh, how certain are we about the sinking of the Chonan? Yeah. Well, uh, let, me, let me give you some background because you've asked the question, and this goes back uh, uh, perhaps to a, an article by uh, Ambassador Don Gregg uh, in which he suggests that there is uncertainty there and that the Russians have confirmed that uncertainty uh, by their reluctance to issue a public report and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I would go, one, I, I wasn't involved, as none of us were in this room, on the joint investigative group, the JIG, that conducted those, uh, that information. Uh, but I would suggest that the composition of the investigation that is primarily South Korean, but a broad base of South Korean experts that had with it the United States, British, Australian, and Swedish experts on there, and they unanimously came to the conclusion uh, that uh, it was a North Korean uh, torpedo. Um, uh, I believe that. I, I've had individual discussions with the North Koreans on that. Uh, their response to me was, oh, well, it must have been an accident of some sort. Um, intelligence people who obviously cannot reveal information or sources uh, suggest that there is no doubt in their mind uh, that this was a North Korean uh, action. And so to answer your question, uh, I, I, don't, you know, I don't think we have very much wiggle room. Uh, and to suggest, as people have simply said, that, um, that, that the rumor of uh, Russians who had no more access to additional information uh, might not be completely satisfied uh, with an investigation that involved four of their officers. You know, how, how do you weigh that against the preponderance of information and evidence uh, and the talent uh, on a five-nation uh, investigative group? And I, for me, I don't have any problems at all moving forward with the, uh, with the acceptance that the North Koreans were involved uh, and they are responsible for that action. Uh, Dr. Cha has argued in the past that North Korea engages in these sort of measures for coercive bargaining. Yeah. Um, do you agree that this applies to this situation, or what do you feel? Can you elaborate on what you think the North, North Korea would have to gain by yeah. such an incident? Um, I, I hold uh, Victor Chaw in the highest of uh, esteem, um, and I think there's elements of legitimacy to the argument in different cases. I don't think this is one of them. Uh, I cannot for the life of me come, to, in, in most cases, I, I don't sign up to that theory, that the North Koreans sit around and say, what can we do? that, uh, oh, by the way, has the potential of sparking another war uh, that will get the South Korean or the Americans' attention. Uh, so when we go to bargain with them, uh, that they will be uh, on the weaker side of the argument. I, that doesn't, just doesn't ring true in, in my involvement with the North Koreans uh, at all. Uh, uh, when you take a look at the incident, there, there are a, a, a number of plausible 
standalone uh, explanations, but I think it's probably a combination of things. Uh, that particular area, as you know, uh, is slightly above the NLL, uh, the northern limit line. I, you may have talked about it earlier, or you will talk about it uh, later today. Uh, that is an extension, a unilateral declaration of the extension of, of the DMZ, or the, the demilitarized uh, zone, uh, following the Korean War uh, that was imposed upon uh, North Korea. Uh, throughout the, the, particularly in the 70s, there's a lot of incidents that occurred in that area. The ones that we are most familiar with took place in 1999, June of 1999, and again in 2002, where there was an active skirmish and a sinking and, and loss of life. I have to admit that what occurred on the 10th of November 2009 in the same area, I didn't think rose to the same level of the two previous, the 99 and 2002 uh, skirmishes there. But obviously, uh, there's a factor here that I should have thought about uh, that didn't until later, and that is uh, in November uh, of 2009, uh, you were in the midst of uh, concern, uh, you know, the height of concern by the North Korean regime on its survivability, whether the Kim family will continue in power uh, should uh, Kim Jong-il drop over dead. Uh, that had only been, what, 15 months or so uh, since he'd had his stroke or his health incident or what, however you want to describe that. They had not yet put in place the measures that we're now seeing, the accelerated movement towards um, uh, succession. Uh, so you can create scenarios that say that when this occurred in November of 2009, the reaction by the North Korean leadership at this very vulnerable point in time was was we have got uh, to respond harshly to this. We cannot be uh, the victim uh, in these incidents. Now, fast forward, who took that ball and, and with what day-to-day -day authority by Kim Jong-il or, or not uh, that it ended up in a decision uh, to use a torpedo uh, that could have killed a lot more people but did kill 46 uh, South Korean sailors? Was Kim Jong-un involved from the very beginning, or was this, uh, as it uh, sometimes occurs in North Korea, um, a revision of history for which he is given credit for after the fact? If the North Koreans believed that this was a successful provocation military exercise that demonstrated for them their national pride or authority, or whatever, however you want to place this, uh, was the Kim the third, given that uh, that uh, um, uh, recognition uh, internally, certainly not externally. Uh, so to you know, to very basically answer your question, no, I don't think it's one in which the North Koreans deliberately were plotting that um, you know nine months later, when we get back to six-party talks, this will give us the opportunity to extract concessions uh, from South Korea and the United States. I don't think that's the case at all. Did you say that Chionan was on the North Korean side of the NLL? No, I'm so, I, I, I said north, but I, I didn't mean that. I, I meant in that area. It, yeah, it was, it was south, the south of the NLL, um, but cl in, in that general region, which the, south, the North Koreans, uh, as you may recall, I think it was probably in the summer of 2006 where the North Koreans uh, laid out uh, we're no longer going to recognize the NL. Here's the new uh, maritime boundary, and here are the passageways in between there. I, I thought, uh, in, in all sincerity, that we would have an incident in the summer um, of 2009. It didn't happen. Uh, so what occurred in uh, later in 2009 was a little bit of a surprise to me. But you're, you're correct. I, didn't, I misspoke. It was not north uh, of the NLL. Yeah, for, for me, there's, um, it's not a, a, an absolute, but there's a pattern involved. Uh, we saw it uh, in um, uh, 2006 
uh, following the North Koreans' first detonation of a nuclear device. And so let me frame it for you. And that is when the North Koreans do something that causes anxiety for the Chinese, that puts them in a very difficult position of either having to support or defend the North Koreans uh, when they think they ought not to. In this case, I do believe that the Chinese made a very early decision that they could not follow the pattern of, of, of 1718 uh, and uh, 1874, UN Security Council resolutions, and sign on to the condemnation of North Korea. That the events that were occurring internal to North Korea uh, were such that the fragility of the regime was at stake. And as you know, as at least I believe, and as you may uh, recognize, uh, for the Chinese, the stability of that border uh, is far more important than denuclearization uh, or the punishment of North Korea. So what the Chinese have done in support of these North Koreans in opposition to information evidence and to common sense and to the consequence of their relationship to South Korea and others uh, has caused the Chinese a great deal of angst in terms of their own relation with, uh, with North Korea. North Korea, if anything else, uh, they're very clever in terms of their relationships. And, and I think as they did in 2000, late October 2006, they did this again. You know, when they go back to the Chinese after having been sternly rebuked uh, by the Chinese and say, you know, we still are committed to the denuclearization. We think that your six-party process is just wonderful, uh, and we'd like to, you know, get back to that. The blood pressure of the Chinese drops. There's a safety valve involved. So these are things that are occurring now in which the North Koreans, in a calculated manner, are trying to mitigate uh, the problems that have occurred because of the Chonan and uh, to send a signal to the Chinese, don't worry, you know, we're not off the reservation. Okay. All right, well, thank you very much. I think we, ha we are ahead of the program, but then we'll take another 15-minute break and we'll resume. Thank you very much. <laughs>